The Osceola River and its associated watershed is a treasure. Some of the most diverse ecosystems in Florida, pristine springs, rapids, limestone cliffs, and archaeological finds unmatched in the southeast are just a few of the features that make this watershed unique. I'm Peter Kleinhens, the Osceola River Watershed Coalition Coordinator for Tall Timbers Research Station and Land Conservancy. I'm going to share the work that three of my colleagues from the Osceola Research Institute, ARI, produced on what makes this watershed so special and so critically important. Recently, Dr. George Cole, a renowned geographer and board member at ARI, began a study of the Osceola River watershed for conservation planning purposes. His slides, therefore, cover the geography of the county that should be considered when planning any type of development in this area. The first illustration depicts the boundary of the Osceola River watershed. The Osceola River itself begins near Thomasville, Georgia, and slowly winds its way down through the Red Hills and continues on through the coastal lowlands to the Gulf of Mexico. Major tributaries include the Little Osceola River and the well-known spring-fed Wasissa River that contains the historic Wasissa Slave Canal. The watershed covers a surprisingly large area, including most of Jefferson County, as well as the eastern portions of Taylor and Madison counties in Florida, and portions of Thomas and Brooks counties in Georgia. It's important that residents of the watershed understand that any runoff in this entire area eventually finds its way into the Osceola River. This slide shows the wetlands within the watershed. As you can see, they form an almost solid north-south wall along our eastern boundary. Wetlands are critical areas, and they should be considered when planning development because wetlands are widely recognized as one of the most important ecosystems on Earth due to their role in water purification, temperature regulation, groundwater recharge, floodwater and carbon storage, and finally, plant and animal habitat. Despite this importance, more than half of the wetlands in the United States have been drained. This is certainly true here in Florida, where well over half of our state once consisted of wetlands. Jefferson County residents, however, are fortunate that over 90,000 acres of the county are wetland, which is the largest amount of any county in North Florida. This has helped them to avoid major flooding and storm surge impacts experienced by many other Florida counties. Our county's unique geography has been shaped by the Earth's climate cycles, which are illustrated in this graph. It shows how climate and sea level have changed over the last half million years. The top dashed line represents average global temperatures over time, and the bottom solid line represents global sea level. As you can see during this period, the Earth has experienced climate cycles with periods averaging roughly 100,000 years. Each climate cycle included a cold glacial period and corresponding lower sea levels and a warm interglacial period when many of the glaciers melted, resulting in higher sea levels. As may be seen, we're currently in an interglacial period with rising temperatures and sea levels. As evidence of the effect of these climate cycles on our land, a very pronounced feature known as the Cody Scarp is located roughly 18 miles upland of our current shoreline. That feature represents the coastline during higher sea levels in the past. This illustration is a LIDAR view of the Cody Scarp as it crosses Jefferson County. You can clearly see the change in topography above and below this line. The location of the scarp is significant for land planning because the Florida aquifer lies just below the ground surface south of the scarp. Thus, that area is extremely sensitive to pollution of our water supply, since any kind of pollutants reach the aquifer very quickly in that area. Further, since we're now in another interglacial period, it may very well be that sea level will reach the Cody Scarp sometime in this cycle. New development south of the Scarp should take this into account. This slide shows important recharge areas in the watershed above the Cody Scarp. You'll notice H, which represents a high recharge rate, and MH, which represents a medium high recharge rate. Clearly, the area of the watershed above the scarp is critically important for recharge of the Florida aquifer, which, by the way, almost 10 million people depend upon for their drinking water and irrigation needs. This illustration depicts the estimated limit of where a Category 5 storm surge would reach. Because of our relatively low elevation, a substantial portion of the county is within those limits. Those areas must also be considered in land development planning, especially due to sea level rise and rising sea temperatures, which, of course, can cause more frequent and more intense storms. 
This is a photo of Big Blue, one of our springs and a part of the last remaining pristine spring system in the state of Florida. At least two species of animal are found exclusively in this spring system, demonstrating its significance that much more. Our whole area is known for having numerous springs and sinkholes where there is a direct connection to the aquifer, and these areas should be avoided in any development to protect the quality of the water in our aquifer and the many recreational opportunities that springs and their spring runs provide us. This last illustration gives you an idea of ongoing efforts to protect the Osceola River corridor. This shows lands along the main river itself which are protected due to public ownership or which are privately owned but protected by conservation easements. We're fortunate in having landowners interested in conserving this important river, and this public-private partnership has resulted in over 70% of Osceola River frontage being protected. The bottom line here is that our area is fortunate in being rich in natural resources such as pristine rivers, wetlands, pure drinking water, and beautiful flowing springs. We need to make sure that these resources are considered in the planning of the development of Jefferson County for their own sake and for the sake of residents who depend upon the natural and economic resources that these resources offer us. Jefferson County, because of the unique combination of natural resources and topography which exists here, has a deep and a rich human history. Dr. Willett Boyer, associate scholar with ARI and expert archaeologist, prepared slides to inform us of this rich past and how this past may benefit our future. Human beings have lived in what is now Jefferson County for more than 14,500 years. Even if one limits consideration of this history to the past 500 years alone, every culture from the late pre-contact period through the modern day is represented in Jefferson County's historical archeological record. The people of the Fort Walton culture, the historical Appalachian Indians, had densely populated the region of Jefferson County, building platform mounds, towns, villages, and clearing vast areas for crops, all by the time the first Spanish conquistadores crossed the Osceola River. Two of the first European expeditions in what is now the United States, that of Panfilio de Navarres in 1528 and that of Hernando de Soto in 1539, encountered the Appalachian and described the richness and fertility of the land they lived in. This same fertility and richness of resources made this region the center of the densest cluster of Spanish missions and cattle ranches and farms, haciendas, from, eight, from 1633, excuse me, through the destruction of the Spanish mission chain in 1704. In the 18th and early 19th centuries, this region was part of the territory fought for by Spain, by England, the Native American nations of the Southeast, including the Creeks, Yamasis, and Seminoles, and after 1783, the newly emerged United States. After American settlement of this region in 1821, Jefferson County was home to several forts established as part of the Second Seminole War, fought from 1835 to 1842, the longest, bloodiest, and most costly war fought by the U.S. against any Native American nation. Within this region were the sites of Fort Vos, Fort Clark, Fort Osceola, Fort Wasissa at the head springs of the Wasissa River, and Fort Gamble, for a time the center of command for the war in Middle Florida, the territory between the Osceola and Apalachicola rivers. Because of this richness of the farmland and the presence of the old fields left behind by the Native Americans and the Spanish, Jefferson County became the richest center of plantation agriculture in Florida, with towns, houses, and farms throughout the area. Most of these plantations and farms were raised and worked by the labor of enslaved people. Because of this, throughout the Jefferson County region, there are numerous cemetery sites, which include substantial unmarked burials dating to the antebellum period, in a number of cases in close association with the marked crypts of the plantation owners themselves. What makes this so unique to Jefferson County is that there are sites, even the unmarked ones, that were never abandoned. Rather, they've often been continuously used through the 20th and 21st centuries, with many remaining in use to the present day. Furthermore, Jefferson County is unique in that even when sites are not actively used, the people interred there have family members and descendants who continue to live in Jefferson County and are part of the modern day communities within the area. A teacher and instructor in Jefferson County has noted that more than half of his students 
have family names that can be linked with the documentary and historical record with both the unmarked and marked historical cemeteries throughout the area. In addition, the totality of these intact sites, undeveloped in their original context in the places that families, churches, and landowners created them, and the sheer number of such sites throughout the region which remain intact is unique in Florida and in most areas of the United States. And that should be preserved for that reason alone. Finally, these historical and archeological sites are valuable for an additional reason. Beyond their importance of the history and the culture of this region, preservation of the sites intact has economic value for the region in the form of heritage tourism. St. Augustine, Florida and Amelia Island, Fernandina Beach are examples of Florida communities in which heritage tourism has provided enormous positive economic impact while both allowing and encouraging historical, archeological and environmental preservation. Lying as it does along a major existing route of travel for tourists and others, preservation study and interpretation of Jefferson County's historical and archeological sites is important for both their own unique and extraordinary value and for the potential for positive and long-term economic impact that they have for our area. The final section of the presentation created by well-known archeologist, Dr. Jim Dunbar, gives an overview of the entire Big Bend region, and it highlights how all of the previously mentioned factors combine to make this area incredibly unique and worth preserving. This slide provides a regional view expanding out to include the Big Bend area of Florida, with Jefferson County highlighted in yellow. First, we look at a digital elevation map of the area, with the green colors representing the coastal lowlands and the browns representing the upland areas. The Cody Scarp in the middle area of Jefferson County provides a clear demarcation of the coastal lowlands near the town of Wasissa with the uplands to the north. This disturbing image depicts the Category 5 hurricane flood zone in the Big Bend area of Florida. Due to the configuration of the shallow continental shelf and the pocket-like nature of Appalachie Bay, the Big Bend area has been identified by the state risk assessment to be one of the most hurricane-generated flood-prone areas in the United States. Please note on this map all the areas totally flooded on US-19, US-27, and US-98 at the Suwannee River, Steenhatchee, near Perry, and along the Taylor County coast. To confound this whole problem, Category 5 hurricanes have been on the rise over the last four years. The six storms include Hurricane Matthew in 2016, Hurricanes Irma and Maria in 2017, Hurricane Michael in 2018, and Hurricanes Dorian and Lorenzo in 2019. Hurricane Lorenzo was an oddball. It accelerated to wind speeds of 160 plus miles per hour before decelerating and slamming into the coast of Ireland. It had the highest intensity for any hurricane east of 50 degrees west latitude on record since about 1851. There are a number of vital areas for threatened and endangered wildlife, in purple, and strategic habitats for these species, in blue, recognized by the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission, or FWC. Threatened and endangered species include the salt marsh mink, gopher tortoise, eastern indigo snake, and eastern black rail, just to name a few. Jefferson County is particularly rich in terms of the number of recorded archaeological and historical sites it has. This map shows standing historical structures in blue, historic, historic bridges in green, historic cemeteries in yellow, and archaeological sites in red. It should be mentioned that the scarcity of non-coastal sites in Taylor, Madison, Lafayette, and Dixie counties is due more to the lack of archaeological investigations in this predominantly undeveloped area. The age range and the preservation of early archaeological sites represent nationally significant resources that are both rare and uncommonly this well preserved. Paleontological and or archaeological sites range in age from 47,000 to 9,000 years old. ARI is preparing a National Historic Landmark nomination for the Page Ladson site in the Osceola River Basin. Among other distinctions, the Page Ladson site is now recognized as the oldest archaeological site in North America, dating some 14,550 years old, and it's right here in our own backyard. There are few sites of this age on the planet having such exquisite site preservation. 
The Florida wetland inventory highlights the extensive wetlands of the coastal lowlands, as well as the flood-prone wetlands of Mallory Swamp and San Pedro Bay in the Big Bend area. Silviculture, or pine tree farming, of the last century saw drainage canals placed throughout both swamps. Nevertheless, Mallory Swamp and San Pedro Bay remain wetlands until prolonged droughts dry them out. Because they're normally wetlands, it's difficult to conduct prescribed burns. So during extended droughts, the thatch built up on the forest floor becomes volatile. The San Pedro Bay Fire of 1998 and the Mallory Swamp Fire of 2008 are stark reminders of fires that ran completely out of control. A coalition of private landowners and the Florida Forest Service now have a cooperative agreement to lessen the chances of wildfires in these areas. Public lands and private land trusts in the Big Bend area represent an important recognition of its significant resources and speak to the effort to maintain some secure conservation for this whole region. In purple, are federal lands, blue state lands, and red are private land trust lands. This final map shows the areas of wetlands and resource concentrations in the Big Bend above or north of the Category 5 hurricane coastal flooding line. As you can see from maps, this area is unique in terms of its geologic, historic, and natural resources. We recognize the economic need of the Oscilla River watershed. But we also recognize the economic potential that this watershed contains. We hope that this presentation highlights the importance of the watershed and why its conservation impacts all Jefferson County residents in a positive way. It's up to all of us to keep this area as great a place to live today as it has been for people over the past several thousand years. <laughs>